Welcome to the Easy Med channel where medical topics are made easy. Today we're going to be talking about different types of gallbladder diseases. Just a quick reminder that if you find the video useful, consider subscribing to the Easy Med channel so you don't miss out on future videos. When learning about the different types of gallbladder and biliary diseases, it can be confusing at first. A lot of the names sound similar. We have cholangitis, cholidocolithiasis, cholecystitis, and cholelithiasis. We're going to walk through each one of these, and by the end of this video, you'll have a good understanding of them. There's also a nice summary table at the end of the video that you can use, so stay tuned until then. Let's start off by looking at the anatomy. That's going to help us better understand the different types of gallbladder diseases. So the gallbladder sits inferior to the liver, and there are a few main structures to know here. The first one is the cystic duct, which connects the gallbladder to the biliary system. Then we have the common hepatic duct, which is formed from the right and left hepatic duct above it exiting the liver. Then the cystic duct and common hepatic duct join to form the common bile duct. Here's a simplified version of the anatomy that we're going to be using for the rest of the video. You can see that we have the liver shown up top, and then the gallbladder is inferior to the liver. We have the stomach, which is going to connect to the first part of the small intestine, called the duodenum, and then the pancreas is shown. So the right and left hepatic ducts are going to come out of the liver, and they're going to form the common hepatic duct. Then we have the cystic duct, which remember connects the gallbladder with the rest of the biliary system. The cystic duct and common hepatic duct then join to form the common bile duct. This common bile duct then empties into the small intestine through the ampulla vata. There's also a duct that goes through the pancreas, and this is fittingly named the pancreatic duct. Now that we have a good understanding of the anatomy, let's talk more about bile. The liver produces a substance called bile, which consists of cholesterol, bile salts, and bilirubin. It's going to release this bile into the right and left hepatic duct. The main goal of bile is to help break down food, specifically fats. So some of this bile is going to travel through the right and left hepatic duct, through the common hepatic duct, through the common bile duct, and empty into the duodenum where it's going to help digest food. The pancreas also releases pancreatic enzymes through the pancreatic duct. And together, the bile and pancreatic enzymes are going to help break down the food content that enters into the duodenum. Now the question is, what do we do with the excess bile? Well, that's where the gallbladder comes into play. The goal of the gallbladder is to store excess bile. So that bile is going to travel through the common hepatic duct, and rather than going into the common bile duct, it's going to turn and go into the cystic duct and get stored in the gallbladder. Then the next time we eat a meal, if we need more bile, the gallbladder is going to contract and release that bile through the cystic duct, and it will enter the common bile duct to enter the duodenum. Now that we have a good understanding of the anatomy and bile, let's walk through some of the different gallbladder diseases. In order to do this, we're going to simplify the image and get rid of the stomach and duodenum. Let's start off with cholelithiasis. So what I like to do is break down the word. I think this will give us a better understanding of the disease process that's going on. So chole means gallbladder or bile. Lithiasis means stone. Think of nephrolithiasis, for example, which is kidney stones. So cholelithiasis means stones in the gallbladder or simply put, they're gallstones. Now, how do these gallstones form? Well, earlier we said that bile was made up of cholesterol, bile salts, and bilirubin. If you get an increased percentage of any of those, it's going to make the bile more concentrated, which could lead to sludge. And as that sludge builds up, it leads to stone formation. Now, there are several risk factors to developing gallstones, and they can be remembered using the five Fs, fat, female, 40, fertile, and foreign. The reason fat is there is because obesity can lead to increased hepatic secretion of cholesterol. Like we said, cholesterol is one of those ingredients to bile. So if we increase the amount of cholesterol, this could increase the chances of developing gallstones. Next, we have female, and that's to help you remember that it's more common in females than males. 40 is there because that tends to be the age range where the incidence is the highest. Fertile is there to help you remember that pregnancy is a risk factor. And the reason for this is because of progesterone. Progesterone levels are elevated during pregnancy, and what progesterone does is it actually decreases contractility of the gallbladder. So if the gallbladder is not contracting as much, then all the content within the gallbladder is just going to be sitting there, and that stasis can lead to sludge formation, which then can form stones. Lastly, foreign is there because you might hear in class or read in textbooks that Native American or European descent is a risk factor for gallstones. It's important to know that a lot of people live with gallstones and they don't have any problems. Gallstones become a problem when they obstruct somewhere in the outflow tract, and that's what we're going to be talking about for the remainder of the video. So with cholelithiasis, a patient can either be asymptomatic or they can have what's called biliary colic. And what biliary colic is, is it's intermittent right upper quadrant abdominal pain caused by temporary obstruction from a gallstone. So let's talk about this a little bit more. A patient could have gallstones within their gallbladder, and those gallstones can shift and move around. 
Well, if one or more of those gallstones moves into the cystic duct temporarily, it's going to create outflow obstruction and cause pain to the patient. This tends to happen after eating a meal. And the reason for this, remember, is after eating a meal, the gallbladder is going to contract to try to release some of that bile to go into the duodenum and help with digestion. Well, during that gallbladder contraction, the gallbladder may accidentally push one of those stones into the cystic duct, which could lead to outflow obstruction and cause pain to the patient. After a few hours or over time, that gallstone can then shift to move back into the gallbladder and the patient's pain will improve. So that's called biliary colic, where the patient experiences intermittent right upper quadrant abdominal pain, usually worse after meals, and it's due to a stone that temporarily obstructs the cystic duct and then moves back into the gallbladder. Most of these cases can be managed outpatient. The way you diagnose this is with the right upper quadrant ultrasound that will show gallstones within the gallbladder. Lastly, how do you manage it? If it doesn't cause much problem, you can manage it conservatively outpatient, but if it is affecting someone's ability to live a normal functioning life, then you can have discussions about an elective cholecystectomy, which is surgical removal of the gallbladder. Moving on to the next gallbladder disease, we're gonna talk about cholecystitis. So let's first break down the word again. We know that chole means gallbladder, cyst refers to the cystic duct, and itis means inflammation. So cholecystitis means inflammation of the gallbladder and cystic duct. So let's talk about what happens here. We know from before that someone could have gallstones within their gallbladder. And we know that those gallstones can shift and move around and sometimes they go and temporarily get stuck in the cystic duct and then they move back into the gallbladder and this is what creates that biliary colic. Well, occasionally what can happen is a stone could go up into the cystic duct and it gets lodged there and it can't move. And what this can do is it causes prolonged obstruction. And now all of a sudden, all the content in the gallbladder has nowhere to go. It's stuck there because there's a big blockage down the road. And this is a breeding ground for bacteria, and it can lead to infection and inflammation. So cholecystitis is when a gallstone goes up into the cystic duct and gets lodged there, leading to prolonged obstruction. And this will lead to inflammation of the gallbladder, as well as the proximal portion of the cystic duct up to the point of the stone that's leading to obstruction. Some of the symptoms that a person may experience with acute cholecystitis includes right upper quadrant abdominal pain, fevers, and nausea and vomiting. An important sign to know for physical exam is what's called the Murphy sign. And the way you perform a Murphy sign is you're going to palpate the inferior border of the liver right where the gallbladder sits. Then you're gonna ask the patient to take a deep breath in. During inspiration, the diaphragm is going to push the liver and gallbladder inferiorly right where you're palpating. And this is going to make the gallbladder push right up against your hand. Well, if the patient stops breathing due to pain, then this is a positive Murphy sign and it could be indicative of acute cholecystitis. Now, how do we diagnose acute cholecystitis? We're gonna use a right upper quadrant ultrasound again. And what you might see on that ultrasound is you could see fluid around the gallbladder called pericholecystic fluid. You may also see thickening of the gallbladder wall. You may also see gallstones present within the gallbladder. If the ultrasound cannot definitively diagnose acute cholecystitis, then you may have to do what's called a HIDA scan. This is when radioactive tracer gets injected through the IV and you watch that tracer as it goes through the biliary system. In a normal situation, the tracer should go and fill up the gallbladder. However, in the case of acute cholecystitis, remember that we have a stone there in the cystic duct. So that's gonna prevent that tracer from going through the cystic duct into the gallbladder. And that could help diagnose acute cholecystitis. The way to treat this is going to be surgical removal of the gallbladder called cholecystectomy. The next gallbladder disease we're gonna talk about is cholecystitis. Let's first start off by breaking down the word again. We know from before that lithiasis means stone. Cholidoco refers to common bile duct. So cholidocolithiasis is the presence of a stone within the common bile duct. This is different than cholelithiasis where a stone was lodged in the cystic duct. Here it's in the common bile duct. Some of the symptoms are gonna be the same in that the patient could experience right upper quadrant abdominal pain. But there's a couple key differences and it's based on the location of the stone. So remember that we said whenever there is an obstruction, it's going to affect everything proximal to it. So in the case of cholecystitis and cholelithiasis, the stone was in the cystic duct. So the only thing that it affected was the gallbladder because that was the only thing proximal to the obstruction. Well, now the stone is in the common bile duct and look at what's proximal to that. Not only do we have the gallbladder, but we also have the liver there. What this is going to do is it's going to obstruct the outflow from the liver. And one of those contents is bilirubin. So what you might see in the case of cholecystitis is elevated bilirubin levels, and this could lead to jaundice in the patient. You may also see elevated AST and ALT levels, which are a measure of the liver function. 
and this is due to that obstruction in the common bile duct that leads to outflow obstruction from the liver. So these are different findings that you may not always see in cholecystitis, again, based on the location of the stone. So how do you diagnose cholelithiasis? You can try to do a right upper quadrant ultrasound. However, it can be more challenging to actually see a gallstone within the common bile duct compared to seeing one in the gallbladder. You may also appreciate common bile duct wall thickening, which could indicate cholelithiasis. If a right upper quadrant ultrasound can't definitively diagnose cholelithiasis, then you can do an ERCP or an MRCP. An ERCP is nice because that's also the treatment. You're going in endoscopically, and if you see a stone there in the common bile duct, then you can go and endoscopically remove it. The final gallbladder and biliary disease we're gonna talk about is cholangitis. So let's break down the word again. Cholangio means bile ducts, and itis, as we know, means inflammation. So cholangitis is inflammation of the bile ducts or biliary tree. Cholangitis is usually caused by some kind of obstruction to the common bile duct. Now this could be from a gallstone like the image here, but pancreatic cancer could also do the same thing, especially if the mass involves the pancreatic head where the common bile duct goes through. That mass could push on the common bile duct and that could lead to obstruction as well. So far you can see that cholangitis looks a lot like cholelithiasis, where we have a stone obstructing the common bile duct. Problems will arise if the stone continues to obstruct the outflow tract. Remember in cholecystitis that we had a stone obstructing the cystic duct which led to inflammation of the gallbladder. Well now in cholangitis we have a stone that's in the common bile duct and this could lead to inflammation of all the structures proximal to it and this will not only include the gallbladder but also the liver and biliary tree. Similar to cholelithiasis, the patient could have right upper quadrant pain as well as jaundice because we're blocking that hepatic outflow and that could increase bilirubin levels. In the case of cholangitis, the patient may also have fever. And this triad of fever, right upper quadrant abdominal pain, and jaundice is known as Charcot's triad. There's also what's called Reynolds pentad, which is the triad plus ultramental status plus hypotension. So that's important to remember that Charcot's triad and Reynolds pentad refer to cholangitis. Now, how do we diagnose cholangitis? Well, it's gonna be very similar to cholelithiasis. You can try to get that right upper quadrant ultrasound, but you may actually need to get that ERCP or MRCP. I do wanna briefly talk about CT abdomen and pelvis because we haven't talked about that yet. You could pick up any of these diagnoses that we talked about so far with CT abdomen and pelvis, but for the most part, right upper quadrant ultrasound is going to remain the imaging of choice when it comes to hepatobiliary disease. Lastly, treatment's going to involve antibiotics as well as ERCP to remove that obstructing stone, and cholecystectomy is also usually performed. So here's what these four diseases look like on the original model. We have our cystic duct, our common hepatic duct, and our common bile duct. Cholelithiasis is gallstones that are in the gallbladder. Cholecystitis is where we have a stone that's obstructing the cystic duct, and this leads to inflammation of the gallbladder. Cholelithiasis is the presence of a gallstone in the common bile duct. Lastly, we have cholangitis, which is obstruction of the common bile duct that could lead to inflammation of the biliary tree, liver, and or gallbladder. Here's a table that I put together that compares and breaks down all the different gallbladder diseases that we talked about. So feel free to use this. It's linked below in the description, along with the EasyMed blog that correlates with this video. So I encourage you to go check it out. I hope this video helped clarify some of the gallbladder diseases. If you found this video content useful and you want to see more in the future, I encourage you to subscribe to the EasyMed channel where medical topics are made easy. You can also follow EasyMed on Instagram at EasyMed Learning. This will help you perform well in class, ace your exams, and keep up with your medical knowledge throughout your career. Thanks for watching, and I hope you check out future videos.